I don't know about you guys, but the mental health is not healthing today. No, we talked about this, I mean, a little behind the curtains, we talked about this before recording, uh, because, you know, as friends do, checking up on each other, but, you know, some days you just stand with your head pressed against a wall for a few minutes and just recalibrate. Yeah, it's like buffering. It's the system crashes (laughs) and then it has to set itself up again. That's exactly what it felt like. Well, at least it's not, okay, have you done this, because I've absolutely done this, where you're staring into nothing and thinking and imagining and daydreaming or working or processing and then you realize oh no it's not nothing i've been staring at a human person this whole time but not processing them and now it's weird i was just gonna say i can comfortably stare at people that i love and not necessarily think about them but just have eyes at them i Mm -hmm. rowan's heard this story before uh i'm trying to remember the context of why she's heard it and i cannot remember but uh i was once sitting outside of a restaurant in la and was staring at a window uh, thinking for, like, mm-hmm. a really long time. Yeah. And probably, like, five minutes. <laughs> and then I realized that there's people sitting on the other side of the glass of the window. And that person no. is just staring at me like, <gasps> what's wrong? And I was like, I have literally been looking at them for so long, not realizing it. And they probably think I'm, like trying to hurt them or like you know what I mean like <laughs> like my, I'm sure my face looked intense and oh, like yeah. angry or like something that I wasn't meaning like you were to, trying to kill thinking. them with your laser eyes right yes. like I was just thinking I mean, his but famous like, laser eyes when I yeah. when I the moment it happened I reflected on the way in which I probably looked which was like mm-hmm. brow furrowed eyes squinted it was also bright outside I was like okay so think, that's my question yeah. were you outside I was outside <laughs> looking at You're the window and it was like You're reflecting. fully absolved. Okay. I think when I'm inside and someone's staring, I'm like, they can't see in here. Okay. I'm invisible. <laughs> That's what I think. I, I think actually you... I'm invisible and they can't see me and I'm... Incredible. I'm that feels like a different issue we should probably tackle, but not for today. <laughs> I thought you were going to talk about your outside thoughts or your inside thoughts. <laughs> I did tell them today that if I don't have an inside brain anymore, that if I don't write it down or type it out, that it doesn't exist in my head. And now it's my outside brain, which is all the notebooks scattered around. Good, good, good. Oh, I, uh, Spencer has heard this, but I had a therapist who was like, okay, we're going to make a little place to put your th- your stress thoughts or whatever mm-hmm. so you can seal it up and walk away. And I was like, I have that. And she was like, wait, what? And I was like, yeah. It's a little one of those like two shelf filing cabinets. It's yellow. Yeah. It's beat up. It's got a key. I can open Ooh. it. The filing cabinet will go forever. I can pretend like I'm going to organize it, but I'll never go back there. Yeah. And then you just lock it up. And then I found out Spencer has a better one. And so I had to make mine better <laughs> because that's the kind of perfectionist I am. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. I, I'm curious what Spencer's is. I, mine was never even so formal as like a filing cabinet and it's yellow. It's just like a jar or a trash can. I'm just like, you go in there and I close the lid. <laughs> Stay away. Leave me oh, alone. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, mine was uh, in a hotel. So I'm in a hotel room. Okay. And in that hotel, there is a safe in the closet. Yeah. Been there. And so I go over and open the safe in the closet and I put the put the thoughts into that and then I close it and I lock it up and then I close the closet door and then I walk out of the room and I close the hotel room door and then I just walk down the hotel uh, hallway as yeah. far as I need. It, uh, of course, has the shining uh, carpet. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just walk as far as I need until I'm no longer thinking about it. And that's what gets me away from it for as long as I need to be away. That's so good and healthy. And also weirdly taps into the, and I genuinely don't remember if we said this all on the podcast or not on the podcast, <laughs> the fact that we have different ways of seeing things internally. Yeah. I don't have the strongest internal mind's eye, but I, you know, I have the strong internal, I guess, mind's ear. <laughs> and I don't know, like, it, 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 I it was the tone of voice, not the thought that made that funny. <laughs> Because as soon as I said it, I was like, don't like that. Don't like it. <laughs> um, but with with Spencer having such a vivid mind's eye and, and, and imagination and then Rowan, you saying like, I am comfortably in the middle. Like that fits. I am. I have some sound thoughts and I have some image thoughts, but I conjure them from the ether. My brain space is a big black void. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 
Is yours not, Spencer? No. <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not always overthinking everything, but... <laughs> it doesn't mean you don't go other places, right? But the, the default... Wait, Spencer? Yeah. What's your what default? What is your default? Like, if I'm thinking about something, it's happening yeah. in the space in in front no, no, of me. No, 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 The place between the thoughts and when then, you're, like, thinking two things. Mm-hmm. So I can visualize it in front of me in the space I'm in. And then if it needs to – if it's somewhere else specific, then the background goes away and becomes the place that it is. Okay. So if it exists, like, what would be in a void, it just exists for me – in the literal space that I'm in, but augmented. Okay. 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 That makes okay, sense. Okay. I do this thing when I find out I'm not really listening to the person who's talking to me, uh -huh. where I go, okay, I'm going to say what they're saying at the same time, which is, of course, not possible, but it means that I, in my head, try to repeat back exactly mm -hmm. what they said as fast as I can to approximate it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I'm forcing myself to pay attention more. That's so smart. I, I sh I'm going to steal that and start doing it. My thing, because outside brain, I just start taking notes mm. and then I have to listen. But you know, obviously that works better for like a, a job than when you're just chit-chatting with a friend. But here's the thing for every friend I've chit-chatted to, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the conversation. Here's the thing. If Tracy really loves you as she really loves me, you would know that she takes notes while you're just hanging out. <laughs> 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 it's awesome yeah i gotta remember it <laughs> uh, i think that's our moment hi i'm rowan hall and i am in tracy's notes Ooh, hi i'm tracy harrison i'm in spencer's mind space hey i'm spencer stark and rowan is in my augmented reality Ooh. Ooh. And this is Willing and Fable, the podcast and augmented reality that brings you original retellings and in-depth research on the history, mystery, and mythology that makes the world so fascinating. Each week, we research a topic from history or mythology, and then we write an original story to go along with that topic. So if you'd like to support our show, consider following us on social media. We are on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter. Or following us into the woods. <laughs> Especially... <laughs> Following us into the woods. Are we on X? Are you guys on X? The artist formerly known as Twitter? Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. That's not mm -hmm. what I will not be saying. We'll that. not no. be defaulting to X. Are we are we blue sky? Are we are we uh threads? Where are we at next? All I mean, of them. All of them. Because we're us, and as soon as one opens up, we go, I wanna be there. I mean I hate to say it, the internet is like the the one and only frontier, right? So when a new social media app builds a continent if you want your flag there you gotta run mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's dark <laughs> <laughs> i'm just laughing because we we're all just staring like yeah that's yeah, dark that's anyway dark. let's talk about silly goofy <laughs> mythology <laughs> tracy laughed so hard that our video call censored it out so it was just me and my thoughts <laughs> oh no <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can also support the show by supporting the people who support us. Uh, we're so thrilled to be partnering with our longtime ad partner and also literal real life bestie, oh God, Leah from yes. Greenleaf Geek. Greenleaf Geek is releasing their fifth annual adventure calendar boxes available for pre-order now until they sell out. There are three tiers available to fit most budgets, and each box includes at least four sets of dice, an exclusive illustrated one-shot, digital downloads, coloring pages, and other TTRPG surprises. So if you have a nerd in your life and you need to get them something for the holidays, the adventure calendar ships worldwide for delivery by December 1st. And when you shop for this awesome holiday gift, don't forget to use the coupon code FABLEADVENT. That's F-A-B-L-E-A-D-V-E-N-T, no spaces, for $8 off. So everyone knows that Leah has made us a few sets of dice. We are very spoiled. But yes. Leah just mailed over some custom D6s that were made especially for Candela Obscura's Quick Start Guide release. It was amazing. It's beyond beyond because all three of us worked on Candela Obscura. Spencer and I are the co-lead game designers. Tracy came out and joined us and it was the best. And 
having an artist then send you a, a piece they created based on what you created is absolutely buck wild. It was so cool to open them up and see they're the you know dark and mysterious and each one has an embed of oh is that a skull or a key <laughs> and it was just as soon as I looked at them I knew they were inspired by Candela that's how well done they were it was awesome I cried <laughs> yes <laughs> I cried ugly I really ugly cried there was snot involved so if you want to not ugly cry don't forget to get yourself some adventure calendars for the holidays uh, or yeah. get one for a friend. You deserve a little treat. Or, or <laughs> <laughs> you can support our show by learning how to juggle as many skulls as you can at one time. Because it's a neat party trick and an effective way to intimidate your enemies all at the same time. But no matter what, we're just happy to have you here. Spencer's a magician. What? Spencer is a magician. Don't tell Don't tell them. Why? Because then they're going to realize it's... Magic? <laughs> I don't know. It's fine. I it's it's one of those things where it's like it's either people are either incredibly excited that you know how to do magic, me. or they That's think me. I'm people. I made Spencer correct. do magic for me for approximately two hours straight. <laughs> Tracy was with us for thirty days. It was the best. We basically had sleepover camp, and uh -huh. we made Spencer do magic on command. <laughs> he <True>. was so. <laughs> so nice about it <laughs> <laughs> the problem is it doesn't matter how many times you do a trick or if i know how it works i am delighted every time same same Rowan and i have the exact same reaction which is to squeal in joy and then make spencer do it again whatever it is it doesn't matter do <laughs> it now, again and now i get now i get videos from both of you of people doing mm -hmm. magic and and you're like well, how, do, how do they how do they do it I'm like do you really want to know? I can I can break it down. Sometimes yes. sometimes I do. Just to give <laughs> you a little I always want to know. I never send it but to you not wanting thing, to know. The magic the magic is also in somebody being able to do it. Yes. It's but the Tracy skill. doesn't write it down. I don't so remember. It doesn't matter that <laughs> no, you genuinely. Told her. <laughs> do I remember how you did any of the card tricks you showed me? No. You could show me again right now and I'd be <laughs> so impressed. My brain is I would say a prison. <laughs> Not a very good one because stuff gets out. <laughs> <laughs> it this is this is awesome. So, what happened is we, Tracy came out for thirty days, and we all had such a good time. And we all, well, rather, we asked Spencer, thinking we we would have to coax him a little bit onto the podcast, and he said yes almost immediately, mm -hmm. uh, like a like a good good lad uh but then what was supposed to be one episode became two mm -hmm. and what was supposed to be two became three this and is that's correct. because we picked a topic that we all are so interested in <laughs> yeah yeah we didn't say we'll do a light little topic we'll ease him in we went no <laughs> biggest disaster in history <laughs> go but yeah, Spencer's been on the podcast. He and I write together all the time. I have no shame about being like do research. This is the longest source list we've ever had. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think it's like multiple pages long. Well, it's a blast, and and I think that you know not only are we talking about like the biggest disaster in history, but but we're also going to cover some like also some just the way that like the Earth is weird, like like mm -hmm. the way that like sometimes things happen, and there's no way for us to. The, the, nobody, the earth has never seen something like that happen before in his, in like written history, right? Not Nothing that we can, that we have seen or have recorded. And it's like, that's kind of once in a, in a lifetime, but by lifetime, I mean, mankind's lifetime uh, event. So I'm really mm -hmm. excited. Yeah. So what, what had happened was, um, Spencer said, what if we cover acts of God? And I said, what if we add Pompeii? And Tracy said, what if we add Herculaneum? And here we are, Pompeii, Herculaneum, and other acts of God. Da -da -da -da. Which, you, you know, <laughs> you have to announce in case you're like me and you let podcasts autoplay just forever. Oh, I am so weirdly neurotic about not doing that because I can't stand just sitting listening to the end of a podcast and being with my inside thoughts. And so I skip and pick the next episode. Correct. That is the correct way to do it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. You don't you don't have that thing. Okay. 
there's a difference though between I'm listening to this podcast and I just don't want to be by myself. And if I just don't want to be by myself and I'm busy and I'm doing things, it doesn't really matter as long as it's a podcast I like. It doesn't matter what they're talking about or I totally understand. I don't do podcasts for that. I play history documentaries on YouTube. <laughs> Me and Mary Beard, we're like this. Tracy, she and I've been through a lot together. Tracy, how are you like our favorite person ever? Like that's the <laughs> coolest <laughs> And I was so ready to be like, don't speak for me. But actually, that is correct. I, you, I, I, the thing, I can make the assumption that you would also feel that way. And which that's the reason why I said our. But like yeah, a thousand percent. I literally have a, a pirate podcast that's just like sitting in queue for when I don't for when I yeah, yeah when I have something that is something stops playing immediately. History podcast comes on. I was so scared for a second you're going to be like, how are you our favorite person when you're such a freaking nerd? But then it was just really sweet and genuine. No, no, absolutely <laughs> not. Just full stop favorite person. That's just, that's Thank the you. end of the sentence. Yeah, That's how you know you found your people when you can be like, yeah, I listen to history documentaries for fun. And instead of being like, okay, mm, cool. They're uh, equally excited to share it there. <laughs> I history forget and nerd that stuff other people cool. aren't like that. Because yeah. I don't spend time with other people. Like, you know, we have our friends and everybody has kind of a, a variety of interests, but n yeah. nothing that is so far out. You know, none of my friends care about basketball. I don't have to True. kind of pretend like I know what that means. But then I go out into the wider world and you this thing you speak of where someone might judge you for liking a history documentary, it, it appears in the wild and is unsettling. Yeah, it definitely happens when you bring your whole self to your corporate job and uh, and forget that while they're talking about the Eagles game you didn't know happened over the weekend, it is weird to bring up fun murder facts. I, I saw this TikTok of this guy who was like, I uh, I was at the store and I like bought some chips and I bought some dip <laughs> and I bought some bowls and I got some – like it's just some snackies and I was going mm -hmm. to check out and the person I can't remember the exact story but it was like but the, something like the person who was who was at the checkout stand was like oh man are you excited for game day and <laughs> and he was like yeah man I'm super excited I'm getting all the snacks and stuff he's like great I hope you have a great we have a great game day and as I was walking away I was like how does he know today's D&D &D day <gasps> <gasps> And then I realized he's probably talking about some sports game that I have no idea about. <laughs> oh, anyway, it, that's so relatable. It was too personal. I felt so attacked. Oh, the number of times I've accidentally gone to the grocery store on Super Bowl Sunday. Right. It's most of them. <laughs> How many Super Bowls are there? I don't know. Everyone at the store. I don't know. But it, uh, hot damn, if there's a Super Bowl, I'm going to choose to go to the grocery store. I feel that way about like Christian holidays. Like mm. I always end up at the grocery store when people's families are shopping for whatever you cook for the bunny, you know, like kind mm -hmm. of situation, a ham, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, yeah, it's usually a ham, <laughs> I think. It's usually ham, yeah. <laughs> and everyone's extended family is coming, so no one is filled with the light of the Lord. Everyone yeah. just hates you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that out of the way, should we talk about Pompeii? Yeah, speaking of the light of the Lord, really quick, I, we got to say what an act of God is because this is a mythology podcast and we talk about many acts of gods. Uh, yes. But according to our sweet baby girl Wikipedia, quote, in legal usage in the English speaking world, an act of God or a damnum fatal, loss arising from inevitable accident, is a natural hazard outside human control, such as an earthquake or tsunami, for which no person can be held responsible. So the long and short of it is, it's a it's a useful legal term. It's a little phrase. Uh, and it also is a content warning. We're talking about natural disasters and all of the human horror that comes along with that. I want to say damnum fatal, rad as hell. I don't know. I want it on a t-shirt. I want it tattooed on Ooh. my lip, on my, like my inside <laughs> of my lip, or like Ooh, across my yeah, knuckles. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Somewhere. I want it. <gasps> Wait, how I many letters? I don't tattoos, but I, but I want it somewhere... I want it as a lipstick shade. Oh, so good. 
Tracy's counting on her fingers. <laughs> it's too just... many letters. <laughs> yeah. It's too many letters to fit on your knuckles, which I'm sure you could look at that word and go, that's too many letters to fit on your knuckles, but they did have to watch me count one knuckle at a time. <laughs> I, I It's an archetype for a kind of character in a film. That's what I was going to say. Like, move over femme fatale. It's damn, damn them, them fatale. fatale. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Move over femme fatale because that's got a lot of connotations. I want I want a they, them, damn them fatale. <laughs> I'm not a femme fatale. I'm a loss arising from inevitable accident. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, while you were what is it that, like while you were studying <laughs> Blade or something I was to, you know what fill in the rest of the joke yourself it's I'm not doing all the work for you <laughs> <laughs> all right Tracy tell us about Pompeii <laughs> would love to all right so everyone knows the ancient city of Pompeii is best known for its Roman remains dating from the infamous eruption of 79 AD but it was actually built on a much older city with the arrival of the Greeks in Campania around 740 BC. There is a lot of history that happens between when the Greeks come to Campania and the eruption of 79 AD. But we, as we mentioned, only have so much time and we've already turned this into three episodes. So I'm going to skip forward a few hundred years and <laughs> fill you guys in on what happens in between. In the early 6th century BC, the settlement merged into a single community and it expanded its borders. By 524 BC, the Etruscans had taken over the area, but they did not conquer the city of Pompeii militarily. Instead... They simply controlled it, and Pompeii enjoyed a sort of autonomy for a while. Hmm. The Samnites conquered the area around 423 to 420 BC, but it's likely that all of the surrounding territory, including Pompeii, had already been conquered around 424 BC. From 343 to 341, there were the Samnite Wars. Around 290 BC, Pompeii was forced to accept the status of Saucy of Rome. This made Pompeians partial citizens of Rome, but the city itself maintained linguistic and administrative autonomy. So far, they're doing great with the autonomy. In the Second Punic War, which occurred between 218 to 201 BC, in which Hannibal's invasion threatened many cities, Pompeii remained faithful to Rome, unlike many of the other southern cities, gaining favor with Rome. In the 2nd century BC, the city gained even more favor with Rome by helping them expand eastward. This brings us, friends, to the Roman period. And after <laughs> a change of heart and a failed attempt to rebel against Rome during the social wars, Pompeii was conquered and brought into the empire and officially became a Roman colony named Colonia Cornelia Veneria Pompeii Anorum. Oh. You know, how... It rolls off the tongue. It's my new D&D character's name. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Do not take Veneria Pompanorum if you are allergic to Veneria Pompanorum. <laughs> if you're suffering from Veneria Pompanorum. <laughs> Please ask your doctor take. before taking Colonia Cornelia. for it. Yeah. <laughs> Side effects may include explosions of... Blindness. <laughs> explosions of, of uh, nearby volcanoes and <laughs> absolute death. All right, so Pompeians were granted Roman citizenship and quickly assimilated into the Roman world. The main language of the city became Latin. I'm going to say it. I think Pompeians really missed the boat on Pompatians. You know what? I'm going to say it. I agree. <laughs> Command F, change the whole document. Change all of them. All right, hold on, hold on. Give me a second. <laughs> That's my two cents. <laughs> Historical people who name things. I, I'm sure there is an etymological reason why it's like where Pompeian would come over Pompeian. Do I know it? No, but I am sure it's there. It was like the <laughs> other day I was texting Rowan about Latin nominative <laughs> declension <laughs> endings. <laughs> well, hold on. What? I asked for this. <laughs> Whenever I need ancient la ancient Latin, no, Latin's only ancient. Whenever I need Latin... <laughs> language information i do not google it i ask tracy which is a really <laughs> insipid little thing for me to do <laughs> in your defense you did google it first you googled and you said what the heck does this mean because it says <laughs> this is a second declension nominative and i know that those are words on their own <laughs> i googled it so badly that i could not get googled to explain the dumb version to me like, I couldn't get it to ratchet it down a yeah. grade level or five. Yeah, it's complicated. So I sent Rowan a long voice memo of me rambling about my thoughts on Latin and what she needed for what she was researching. 
it wasn't even for this episode. I got to get in on these Latin <laughs> history oh, lessons. Happily. What's happening? I, I okay. couldn't remember which chat it was in. I, th- I, for, I genuinely Here's thought it was in our group it chat. It was in our group chat, Spencer. You um. just <laughs> were living a life. Got it. Well. It had nothing to do with you, but I put it in our group chat because I'm an agent of chaos because you knew that he wanted to learn the latin facts. that's why that's why okay it's my fault no look here's the thing i'll take i'll take ownership i missed it that's my bad i don't know how voice memos work i think they disappear after a little bit no they don't do they i don't have them on my end so if you saved them it's saved on your <gasps> end but not mine i didn't do that oh darn it i All hate right, anyone it who knows a lot about <laughs> about voice memos please gen z come to the rescue so back to pompeii yes by this point in Pompey's history, people have Latinized their names. They are fully a Roman colony, and the people were fairly accustomed to experiencing minor earthquakes. In fact, Pliny the Younger noted that such tremors were common in Campania and generally not a cause for great concern until <laughs> February the 5th, 62 AD. A powerful earthquake struck the region, causing significant damage in the Bay Area and especially to the city of Pompeii. This earthquake is estimated to have a magnitude ranging between five and six on the Richter scale. I wish there was a way that I knew what that meant physically. You know, it's pretty intense. I think that lists it as a medium to strong earthquake. I don't live in a particularly earthquake prone area, so I don't have a good gauge for what they feel like. Call out. I hear you. I live in an earthquake prone area, but I often sleep through them. As, you, as is your right. <laughs> Spencer, native Californian? Yeah, I mean, I've been through a couple, but I just think of like the San Francisco earthquake as the point of reference as far as damage is concerned. I, I honestly, I mean, I've been in many earthquakes and I most of them have just kind of felt like some rocking back and forth or rolling. Like that's the rolling. weird thing. It's like either like uh, shifting left and then right and then left and then right. Or it's like, I remember when there was an earthquake during the pandemic and I, um, I had the sink filled up with water cause I was doing dishes and it was, uh, I had like filled it up so I could dunk a bunch of water uh-huh. or dunk a bunch of dishes into the soapy water. And the only reason I realized, realized that the earthquake was happening was because all of a sudden the water started to roll like, like it was ocean waves. Whoa. And so it, the whole, like, like the, the surface of the water started rippling and doing like a, an up and down motion. And then I realized that the world around me was also moving the leash for my dog was swinging back and forth like so oftentimes if it's not that strong it's hard to tell until kind of afterwards and you get a little bit like um any for me my stomach also turns just Mm -hmm. a little bit like i'm on a that's not surprising at all uh, because your inner ear is like i it's the same thing of motion sickness i feel that i am moving but i don't see my body moving and what your brain apparently is doing tiktok told me this could be a lie is it goes well i must be poisoned then because something is really off and my inner ear is freaking out and so if i'm poisoned i need to get rid of the poison and that's why you get nauseous actually quick follow-up to that really quick i promise Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. spencer asked me this the other day because i had watched a tiktok that said you know the quintessential femme experience is just always being a little nauseous yes you know you're not gonna throw up but it is deeply unpleasant and you don't necessarily have a good reason Mm -hmm. um and then spencer asked why why are all the girlies nauseous and i didn't have an answer Uh, the only thing i can say is it well if i'm being like legit probably because of our hormone cycles and the fact that we exist on a a monthly cycle and men exist on a 24-hour cycle but Um, i'm always nauseous (laughs) I know, and I always have a little bit of a headache. That's my cross to bear. That's my burden in this world. Well, I'm so sorry for you. I wish that uh, I wish I could take away all of that pain for both of you. That sucks. The thing, the thing is, I know you mean that so genuinely. I do genuinely. Not, mean not that. to say you don't mean it genuinely. I just know that given the opportunity, you actually would do that. I just feel bad. It sucks. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull us back really quick because I did. Google the San Francisco Bay Area earthquake of 1989, um, uh-huh. and that had a magnitude of 6.9, um, and it killed 60, 
seven people and caused five billion in damages. So if that mm. gives any oh scale as to like, I mean, this is a five to six magnitude earthquake in mm -hmm. Pompeii. And the 1989 San Francisco Bay Area earthquake was a 6.9. So like... It's not the same, but also killing 67 people and causing 5 billion in damages is significant. Yes. I also imagine that buildings in Pompeii were in some ways made much better and in some ways made much worse. Mm -hmm. Totally. Mm -hmm. So interestingly, at the time, people did know that earthquakes were not a good sign for the future, which was something that I really endeavored to find out because it's one thing to say, oh, this is bad currently, but it's a, an, it's another thing entirely to understand that it means future badness, mm -hmm. especially before all of our science and uh, seismic seismometers. Seismology? Seis what's a seismic thermometer? Graph. Seismograph. <laughs> <laughs> a sization I, as I always call it solidarity it's sization you're wrong <laughs> she's right you're wrong <laughs> so after this round of earthquakes that we're talking about a few folks who only vacationed in Pompeii just never visited their vacation homes again Mm. which is giving Oprah in Hawaii to me but I do mm -hmm. think it's worth emphasizing that this was a resort city. <laughs> yes. And a lot of politicians had homes here. Very wealthy people had homes here. And so some of them just said, you know what? I don't need it and closed up shop. So between 62 AD and the eruption in 79 AD, most rebuilding was done in the private sector and older damaged frescoes were often covered with newer ones. An important field of current research concerns structures that were restored between the earthquake of 62 and the 79 eruption. It was thought until recently that some of the damage had still not been repaired when we got our big mm -hmm. Pompeii incident, but it's doubtful as evidence of missing forum statues and marble wall veneers are most likely due to robbers after the city's burial. It's also interesting to me, I mean, you know, we're talking about time in a way that we've when we do time in the past, it feels a little more compacted, at least to me. Mm -hmm. And looking at 62 to 79, I mean, there was an earthquake that was pretty brutal in 62 AD. And then it was 17 years before the eruption. That's like a 20-year-old becoming a 40-year-old, essentially, right? Like, like we, this is yeah. not it, – it, it seems like it's a small amount of time when we look at it as – when we look back on it. But – in the moment, I can only imagine that after like a couple of years that some people were like, oh, everything's fine. That is enough time for low rise jeans to come into fashion, fall out of fashion and then come back around. Right. Which is so wild when you're used to talking about two, three, four hundred years between historical events. I totally get what you're saying. The fact that it's within a single person's potential lifespan and many people's lifespans. There was also a bit of a religious shift in Pompeii after the earthquake of 62 AD. Unsurprising at the time, it was an act of God. Macquarie University of Australia writes in the article Pompeii and Herculaneum, quote, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva constituted the Capitoline Triad and were required to be worshipped by all under Roman rule. However, there appears to have been a shift in religious attitude, especially in regards to the people of Pompeii after the earthquake of 62 AD, with the worship of foreign gods and cults, specifically the mystery cult of Isis, increasing in popularity, end quote. Due to the preservation of the archaeological site that makes it as famous as it is today, we're able to get a much closer look at the temple's tombs and larium, which are, we've talked about this in past episodes, they're the household shrines for household spirits gods known as lair mm -hmm. they became tutelary spirits known as brownies i could go on forever so i won't one fascinating <laughs> artifact uncovered in the 1930s is an ivory figurine of the indian goddess lakshmi and it's believed that the figure made its way to pompeii via trade from the ancient kingdom of gandhara which was northwest of what is now modern day pakistan i think that this is a really important little detail for us to point out because if I'm not careful, I will fall into the trap of putting like famous ancient societies in their own little bubble mm -hmm. and forgetting to remember how much they interact with one another and how, especially at this time, how far trade could go. It is pretty stunning to think that even that long ago, people were trading across that 
vast of distances. And it makes me wonder, like, did they get it from uh, somebody who had gone to Pakistan or did they like, you know, what, what, what did they travel there? How many people right. did it pass through to get there? Like, there's all of those questions around how I, I, I guess being the coming into the the history mystery mythology podcast as a, as a <laughs> layman uh i don't my brain can't fathom the like understanding of how far people could travel at that time safely mm -hmm. what the time scale of getting something from somewhere that you know is modern day pakistan to pompeii like what what kind of journey would that go on how long would that take would it be months i don't even know that's not because you're a layman. People, humans are bad at conceptualizing time. Yeah. But I find it so fascinating because, you know, we, we talk now about the, the seven wonders of the world or the ancient wonders. And there were literally brochures in by points in history of the ancient wonders that you had to go visit. And things like souven decorated souvenir cups from a gladiator fight. We've always been people and we've always wanted to explore and bring things back and trade things and share things and share ideas. And then seeing this, because I, Rowan, I so agree, I always put societies and cultures into the little bubbles because it's easier to organize that way. But that's not how we live now and it's not how they lived then. If everyone can imagine Hercules, the Disney movie, that song where Hercules' face is being slapped on cups and sandals and stuff, uh -huh. that's not actually far from the truth. <laughs> Ancient World Magazine writes, Syncretism is a common feature among ancient polytheistic religions, where deities or heroes of one culture were often equated with the deities or heroes of another that shared a number of characteristics. Aside from Venus Sri Lakshmi, examples include Zeus Amon, Greek Zeus and Egyptian Amon, and the hero Hercules Magnusanus, whose Roman Hercules himself adopted from the Greeks, and then the Celtic Germanic hero Magnusanus worshipped by the Low Countries. End quote. It's so good. It's so good. I always think about, we talked about Herm Anubis, Hermes and Anubis that got combined. So here is a photograph of the figurine. I don't have anything for scale, really, but this was... It could not have been bigger than like a massive Nalgene, you know, those aggressively okay. large Nalgenes <laughs> based on the other things that it was around. Okay. Okay. So this is a beautiful ivory figurine of the goddess Lakshmi wearing not a single bit of clothing other than beads. But the detail on this is what's really blowing my mind. Yeah. There, You can see every line in detail. I think you can even see like her toenails. Oh, you can. And for it to be that little, uh, incredible. Yeah, she's just wearing a belt and some beads and like a, maybe a headdress or maybe that's her hair. It looks like there's something on top of her head and then there's mm -hmm. maybe hair underneath. Um, but she also has what look like what I thought were maybe pouches or something at her waist and what I now zooming in on it appear to be children or. Yeah, she has a child on either side of her hip. I really thought they were pouches and you, they're children. As soon as you take a second look, yep. yep and then it's interesting because her her left leg is crossed over her right out in front of her. Mm -hmm. And then there's something around her ankle. I can't tell if that's supposed to be like a – it looked – when when I first looked at it, I was like, is that a hand? And I, I don't think it's a mm. hand. I'm not sure what it is it's grabbing or that is wrapped around her ankle, if it's something that's grabbing her ankle or if it's like a massive anklet. Of some yeah. kind. Hard to tell. It's just so perfectly preserved. It's She's not missing a digit or her nose or any – you know, a lot of yeah. times these things survive, but the, the fingers that stick out fall off. Not even a little bit. That's such a good point. You could buy this today. Yeah. And you could see it in a shop today. Oh, my gosh. Tracy, tell everyone what you titled this section. <laughs> I had fun doing the titles uh, – for, for some of these sections. And I knew I wanted to talk about Pliny the Younger and Pliny the Elder. And so what better way to title it than a Pliny for your thoughts? But um, <laughs> So we haven't talked about Pliny the Younger or Pliny the Elder too much on this podcast, which is crazy because Rona and I talk about them more than I think the average person does. More than we talk about any known sports human that's alive or dead. That is so very accurate and correct. Sports human. I couldn't think of a single sport in time. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely, in that moment, couldn't have, couldn't have come up with a single athlete. Michael Jordan. 
Michael Jordan. Wait, Michael Jordan was who was in Space Jam? Was that Michael Jordan? Uh, <laughs> yes. And then LeBron James was in the remake. That's all I know. That's as much as I know. We've reached the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> And that's how you know you're with your people because you go, hey, I've got some thoughts on Pliny the Elder. And they're like, oh, thank God. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so the TLDR version is that Gaius Plinius Caecilius Secundus was born in 61 AD and died in 113 AD and is better known as Pliny the Younger. Again, D&D character. That's my D&D character calling it now. No. If you're suffering from Gaius Plinius, <laughs> <laughs> I asked you, doctor, before taking about Caecilius Caecilius Secundus. Secundus. <laughs> Good. Yes, I, I don't know. I do like that as a a D and D character name, but I feel like it would have to be a really obnoxious, either like a really obnoxious bard or like a noble something. You know, like you right. gotta hear me out. Someone you can stab. An NPC that you can it's, stab. Yeah, it's, yeah. that's everyone, yeah, maybe. I, I, I'm wondering, too, like, is there, and this is outside of uh, mm -hmm. what we're talking about here, so forgive me. Is there a reason why so many people had four names? Yes. Thank you Tracy for asking knows this. this. <laughs> I have oh, no God, research Tracy, to back up. <laughs> I love you so much. Please put it in my ears. <laughs> oh, all right. I love you guys both, too. So I don't have any uh, research to back this up, so they may not be completely factually accurate, but there was a name system in Rome uh, that was called the, the trinom tri trinomial system. So you had three names. Uh, and your first name meant something, your middle name meant something, your last name meant something, and it related to your family, your place in the family. So girls, if the oldest daughter was named Claudia, the next daughter would just be like, Claudia too. So that's where you see Gaius Plinius Caecilius Secundus. It's because he's the second one. It, Got it. Imagine if you, Tracy, and all your sisters. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're Catherine one, Catherine two, Catherine three, Catherine four, Catherine five. <laughs> so Thank good. you for letting me uh, geek out about that. That was great. I, and, and then I have one more follow up question for you. So we yeah. call them Plenty the Younger, Plenty the Elder, but it's it's Gaius Plinius. Mm -hmm. So is it are they, are they going by their second name? Is Gaius yeah. something? Okay. Yeah, so uh, you don't always necessarily go by your first name. Actually, the famous Caesar that we all know is Gaius Julius Caesar. That's his his full name. I know that this is not accurate, but Gaius always just makes me feel like it's like Mr. Like, dude, Plinius. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good fantasy version of like, sir. Love Gaius. It. Gaius. Mm, Gaius. Magaius. Magalus. <laughs> <laughs> Pliny the Younger was a lawyer, author, and magistrate of ancient Rome, and his uncle, Pliny the Elder, helped raise and educate him, and Pliny the Elder was a Roman author, naturalist, natural philosopher, a naval and army commander, and a friend of Emperor Vespasian. He wrote the encyclopedic Naturalis Historia, which became an editorial model for encyclopedias. And also, he just used it to talk about every disease you could think of and every plant in the world. I mean, there's volumes and volumes and volumes of this. And if you're interested in medical history like I am, then you know of Pliny the Elder because he has a cure for everything. And by God, do none of them work. Incredible. The hubris, <laughs> the audacity. Yes. Yeah. He's like, you know what? It'd be really good for your cold hemlock. A little bit of that in your wine. Hear me out. What are you trying to what are you trying to do to cure the cold? Because you don't have a cold if you're dead. That's true. You're right. It does <laughs> it does stop the cold. I don't think it was plenty, but someone in history did say that if you have the plague to strap a chicken to yourself. And I really do enjoy that one. Live. A live chicken to yourself. Huh. I think the thought process was the disease would go into it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> on the day of the eruption, <laughs> as Pliny the Elder's vessel approached... We're just approached moving on like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, great, cool. Yeah, just drop the chicken to yourself <laughs> and move on. I'm here for it. Sorry, let's no, keep well, moving. No, well, it's good that you did because I was sitting here thinking, I think kissing the chicken or like giving mouth to mouth to the chicken would work better if you're trying to put a disease in it. Like, not that that works necessarily, but the logic makes but more sense. But that's because you know how diseases work. If you've got like boils on your skin... And you're like, get these boils off me onto that chicken. Yeah, you'd probably strap it to yourself. Just scrub yourself with a chicken? I, I can't emphasize enough how much Pliny the Elder wasn't good at coming up with solutions. 
He just did it a lot. I think he had, like, that has to be somebody who's like, yeah, just put a chicken on it. Let's just watch yeah. that guy do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, just being the most little mm-hmm. gremlin imaginable. It's the early stages of, like, I watched a video of, of the ancient Chinese practice of making blush. And yes, there I were, watched the same one. There were 50 steps with at least five caustic chemicals. And you got to wonder how they got there. That the, the chicken is step one. Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. At some point, they're going to realize that the chicken isn't the important step. It's just a metaphor. It, it's gonna, no, no, no. It's going to take them way too long to realize. Like, it, yeah, the, the, the recipe is first you strap a chicken to yourself for six days. Then you ground sage into a powder. And uh-huh. then, you know, you let it – you put it in water, let it ferment. And then they get like natural uh, – natural – Antibacterial, uh, what is it? Penicillin, right? I like think natural Spencer penicillin. is discovering penicillin. <laughs> right. What I'm saying <laughs> is, here going, it's going to take them okay. so long to realize that the, the chicken, chicken has no it. part of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> they're going to do the whole process because that's what mm-hmm. it took to get them there. And then at some point, yes. they're going to realize we could just take the chicken out. For anyone interested in any of this, I highly recommend the podcast Sawbones, a marital tour for misguided medicine. It's, uh, you know, Justin McElroy and Sydney McElroy, and she's a doctor and talks about, they talk about medical history. He is not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about Pliny the Elder. Pliny the Elder tried to sail into Herculaneum on the day of the eruption, but as he began to approach, cinders and pumice began to fall on their ship. The helmsman advised turning back, to which Pliny replied, Fortune favors the bold. Steer us to where Pompeii is. Upon reaching the city, they found that the same winds that brought them there prevented them from leaving. That group waited for the wind to abate, but they decided to leave later that evening for fear that their house would collapse. The group fled when a plume of hot, toxic gases engulfed them. Pliny suffered from a chronic respiratory condition, probably asthma, and thus likely died from asphyxiation caused by the toxic gases and he was left behind if anyone ever says fortune favors the bold to you that's how you know it's a bad idea do not okay all right noted is that and this is the first recording of that phrase right like that phrase comes from this i think so okay mostly because when i was talking to people about researching this one of my friends went is that the fortune favors the bold guy so No, guys, come on. It doesn't come from him. First, you start with strapping the chicken. (laughs) Of course, you're right. Yes, of course. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah, as the guy strapped the chicken to his chest, he went fortune favors the bold, and then, uh uh-huh, yep. And then off he sailed, and and there he went. In 1967, science historian Conway Zirkel stated that, quote, there is widespread and persisting misinformation about Pliny's death, end quote. Pliny the Elder famously was said to have tried to go in and rescue people and thus bravely died. But despite this, he never came within miles of Mount Vesuvius and no evidence has been found that shows he died from breathing in fumes. And Zirkel concluded that Pliny the Elder probably died of a heart attack. It's not as cool. It's not It's not as cool. It's not why. as dramatic. Yeah. I, I could imagine a volcano erupting and... And then, you know, being like, yeah, let's go. And then just it, it, getting scared and dying. Like, I feel like a heart attack is not that is, – is not off the table given what the mm. the yeah. actual scene probably was. Oh, my God. Of, of course. It, it, I'm sure it was absolute devastation. Because the thing that I always wonder is what were ancient Romans thinking about in terms of the scale of the world? Like when we have a natural disaster happening somewhere today in this World Wide Web interconnected globe, we can be like, well, it's only happening there. And there could extend for any given distance, but it's it's in this localized place. They had travel. They had distances. But if you see a volcano erupting into the sky and throwing ash down, how far do you think it goes pre-internet? Oh, I think probably forever. If I'm guessing, but I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I probably would think, yeah, this is it. It's it for me. It's it for everyone. Yeah, I struggle. It feels reductive to be like, they probably just assumed the whole world, but there is no whole world, right? The, mm-hmm. And they know that other cities don't experience rain when they experience rain. That's true. 
What's interesting is news traveled really fast in ancient Rome. You know, there's a famous saying, all roads lead to Rome, but it's kind of true. They really prioritized building roads and organizing highways. And then they had basically forums and notice boards in every city. And within days of this event, everyone knew about it. Wow. So now we're going to talk about what daily life was like in Pompeii. I titled this section, I'll Take My Garum to Go. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> garum was a very – you can still get it today. I'm sure there are many people out there who are like, I know exactly what garum is. But it's kind of a condiment. It was like the condiment of ancient Rome, and it's a fish sauce um, and apparently very pungent. And if you like food history, uh, Tasting History by Max Miller on YouTube uh, is a show where he recreates historical recipes as accurately as possible and tastes them and also does research on the history. And he has an episode on garum and ancient Rome. Was it good? No, he didn't really like it. He said it was insane. Um, I think he, I think he kind of enjoyed it, but it was like it stunk up his entire Californian apartment, and he was like very <laughs> good. Is also so relative. Like, what culture were you raised in? What flavors are you uh -huh. not only personally like, but are you expected to like? Right. Yes. I think the only thing he hasn't liked on the show, like truly deeply, was hardtack. Uh, yeah, because hardtack is not for enjoyment. It's, it's you're not even supposed to like being alive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So because of the nature of the eruption, daily life in Pompeii is actually something we can study. And Pompeii's amphitheater was built sometime after 80 BC, making it the oldest known example of its kind in the Roman world. We always think of the Colosseum and theaters in Rome, but Pompeii did it first. <laughs> Spectacles took place in the arena and often lasted two or three days, and they were highly publicized and well attended, not only by the citizens of Pompeii, but also by people from neighboring towns. And they sometimes became just as, if not more rowdy than modern day sporting events. In fact, in 59 AD, a riot broke out in the amphitheater between Pompeian fans and the people of nearby Nucuria. And as a result, <laughs> the amphitheater was closed, at least to some degree, for 10 years Years. It only reopened because the emperor's wife at the time wanted to go to Pompeii and see a show. Imagine the kind of riot that you'd have to have now to close down like an arena for 10 years. <laughs> I know. It's nice to know I wouldn't like sports no matter the century. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what did the Romans eat? Uh, Tracy, what did the Romans eat? Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for asking. That was a really great transition. Thanks. Uh, so the Roman kitchens were small, poorly lit rooms. You'd think they'd be the center of the home, but they weren't. Uh, the center of the home typically was an open sort of think uh, open sky forum that connected the rest of the home. And the kitchens were usually tucked away at the back of the house. In most of the kitchens excavated at Pompeii, the only permanent feature left is a masonry hearth with a tile top and arched recesses at the bottom for storing fuel. Cooking was done on this open hearth with pots set on iron tripods over burning charcoal or wood. However, and I think this is so cool, it was not uncommon for citizens to eat takeout rather than cook their dinner at home. Snack counters called thermopylia were common and offered things like mulled wine, baked cheeses, lentils, nuts, breads, and meats. They had large jars built into the counters which held dried, cold foods that could be heated up for customers. And these places usually served food to go, though some fancier shops had seating areas inside. That is such a cool detail. It's such a cool detail because I think more often than I probably anyone around me about the eating habits of people in history because I think, you know, you have to feed yourself no matter where and when you live. And I spend so much of my time thinking about food and how I'm going to make it or where I'm going to get it or all of that. And I started to think about what did they do in history because they didn't have a fridge they could stuff their leftovers into for a lot of history. And then learning that people in ancient Rome or ancient Pompeii would go and get takeout if they didn't feel like cooking, just like me. It's such a cool connection. What? Who was? Who was the? Who was dry? Not driving, I guess. Who was like carting uh, food around the city, right? As like the delivery person, like that had if yeah. takeout existed, there had to be some sort of like, hey, oh, I'm yeah. paying you to bring me food on on this night, right? And somebody makes the run yeah. with your food to bring it to you. It's uh, interesting. I also was wondering if we know why the Roman kitchens were so small and poorly lit. It seems like if they were having to make food, you know, even if they went out to eat 
a couple of nights a week that like they would have to be making food all the time. Do we know why they decided to make them so small and like? Typically, the kitchens were where like servants and and slavery was a big part of the Roman culture. That was where they worked. The dining rooms were insanely elaborate. But also think about it, even if you're not wealthy enough to own people to work for you, who's working there in their stead? Your wife. Mm -hmm. like, the, the classes of society are just don't make the ranks, I don't think. And because it wasn't a focal point of the home where people gathered and talked, you know, it, it just didn't need to be this centralized open space because they had other centralized open spaces and um, dining rooms where, I mean, famously, the the way you ate in ancient Rome was you would like lay down and eat. Ugh. You think about all the cushions and everything. Amazing. And there were some dining rooms where they had water features where water would flow through the whole room as you're sitting above it and laying on cushions and eating your food that's brought to you. So that was the spectacle, not the kitchen. Yeah. So there's an interesting detail in Pompeii. There's a fountain that, you know, anyone could go to. And if you go to it today, you can see next to the carved face where the water would spout out, there are grooves on either side that are just from the thousands and thousands of people putting their hands in the same place to lean over and drink water. And the groove is deeper on the right-hand side, which shows that even then there was a higher number of right-handed people versus left-handed people. Oh, that's so cool. I, I love that. It's a like uh, those sculptures that when everybody touches the same place, they become uh -huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I love seeing that. So if people know only one thing about Pompeii, it is that it was covered in volcanic ash from this eruption. It had long been thought that the infamous eruption of Mount Vesuvius occurred on August 24th, 79 AD, but another account gives a date of the eruption as late as November 23rd. The later date is more consistent with a charcoal inscription at the site, discovered in 2018, which includes the date of October 17th and which had been recently written. A collaborative study in 2022 determined a date of October 24th to October 25th for the eruption. So you can see that until last year, mm -hmm. people have still been working on trying to get this date. And the layman has long believed that the eruption happened in one day, but in fact, it took place over two. Uh, there were four days of earthquakes leading up to this big eruption, but the people in the region weren't as phased by them as we would have hoped, not unlike people today. Uh, they didn't have, everyone didn't have the get the hell out of Dodge energy mm -hmm. that it would have taken to get away from Vesuvius in time. And Tracy, we skipped over the name of this section, but I can't stop reading it. Can you please give us the name of the section? I would love to. The title of this section is Eruption. I hardly know her. So good. Excellent. So on the morning of the disaster, Pliny the Younger, who watched from across the Bay of Naples, which is about 18 miles away, compared the eruption to a cloud of unusual size and appearance, like a pine tree that rose to a great height on a sort of trunk and then split off into branches. Uh, today, geologists refer to this type of volcanic blast as a Plinian eruption, which is fascinating. They named it after Pliny. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. That's my new dream. I want a natural disaster. Incredible. Named yes. After me. Yes. So good. I want a cloud, a type of eruption, a type of explosion named after me. Honestly, any I'll take any natural phenomena. You want to name a, a new a new type of cloud after me? I love it. <laughs> um, so we're looking at types of volcanic eruptions here and then a drawing of the Plinian eruption. Uh, and it's just fascinating to see the way in which like there's there's all kinds of eruptions that can happen from a volcano. And this one was very specific. I don't know if one of you wants to talk about it. Sorry, is one Strombolian? Yeah. Um, so the, the Strombolian one uh, is a little bit straight up and then kind of a poofy, That's broccoli a looking cloud. That's a real thing. Uh, the <laughs> Plinian eruption goes straight up and, as described, branches off slightly, uh, although it's – I would say it's not quite pine tree to me. It's more like uh, there's – when you see the forests where all the canopies mm. combine at the top. At the Lorax, the truffula trees. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Petition to rename this volcanic eruption type. Well, and the Plinian is interesting compared to the Strombolian because the Strombolian looks like the the fire or the magma. Uh, it's not magma. The lava uh, is um, is coming out and 
and stopping like right at the top of the volcano where the Plinian, yeah. it extends up into the sky. I wonder if there's more of a uh, uh, pressure that has built. So when it does explode, it pushes the um, the like eruption higher than it would in, in Strombolian or Hawaiian or any of the others. Looking at the different types of volcanic eruptions, the Plinian does look so very much the most violent and intense. It does look the worst, although I imagine if you're in one, worst is a very relative. Yeah. That's a very good point. <laughs> um, so as is cool, the Tower of Debris drifted to the earth, first the fine-grained ash, then the lightweight chunks of pumice and other rocks. And people describe the site as terrifying. Pliny wrote, quote, I believed I was perishing with the world and the world with me, end quote. But early on, most Pompeians had plenty of time to flee, and many did. But thousands of unfortunate souls did not. Mount Vesuvius violently spewed forth a cloud of superheated debris and gases to a height of 33 kilometers or 21 miles, ejecting molten rock, pulverized pumice, and hot ash at 1.5 million tons per second, ultimately releasing 100,000 times the thermal energy of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's an incredible amount of energy, uh, 100,000 times the atomic bombings. Wow. Well, I'm still stuck on ejecting molten rock at 1.5 million tons per second. That's just numbers I can't even put into concept. And also, we hadn't even touched on 21 miles up. It, it, it spewed all of this. Yeah. I mean, it had to, that had to absolutely cover the entire sky for these people. No wonder Pliny mm. wrote that he thought the world was ending. Yeah. I would too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the, I believed I was perishing with the world and the world with me. And he, I mean, everything from everything that they could see, I'm sure, was just covered in smoke and ash, like li literally as far as they could see in any direction. I imagine visibility was actually quite bad, which would make it even scarier. That's true. I didn't even think about that. Oh, I bet it. It was so dark and smoky. Yeah, I don't think it's it's not like the sky was cinders and the world looked ablaze. I think everything was just gray, black st dust in the air. Ooh. Yeah, I wonder how far in front of you you could see, right? Like if you could only see you know, 10, 20, 30, even 50 feet in front of you and everything else was ash, no matter how far you walked, it just you were just caught in that. Like it would feel like it was never going to end. Uh, and it's terrifying. So by the end of the second day, the eruption had ceased. Let me be clear. By the end of the second day, 48 hours of this, mm. the eruption ceases. And it left behind a hazy atmosphere through which the sun cast a feeble light. So, yeah, I mean, I could only imagine the darkness that overcame you. And, and also, like, the sun is setting and coming back up. And I'm sure there's a change in light. I'm sure they can still tell when it's nighttime and when it's daytime. But mm. the idea that, like, the whole city was covered in darkness for 48 hours. I'm sure people felt it for miles and miles and miles. I mean, think about... This summer, you know, there was the wildfires in Canada and I'm all the way down by Philadelphia and I had days where it was hard for me to breathe the air. Wow. And that is really far away. And, you know, years ago when there was the eruption of the volcano in Iceland, we were getting smoke over all the way over in America. So you have to imagine people felt this way beyond just Pompeii and Herculaneum. And to feel it and not even know why. <sighs> You're right. Be like, okay, looks like the world ends, is ending over there. Uh, uh, hopefully our gods aren't mad at us. Like, I I don't know. Do you think there are people who got the weather before the news? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, big time. Well, and I also think about, like, the amount of heat, right? So even, like, I know we're going to talk about heat at some point with this, but, like, within a radius of the volcano, there's a very obvious amount of heat, but, like, for me, the inter the other interesting piece that I don't immediately think about is like, what about the places that are just outside of the area where you get crisped, where it just becomes warmer? Like radiation. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. I wonder if 
the eruption was fast enough and big enough that it beat the ability of some birds to fly away. Oh, so certainly. Like birds are always the thing, right? They yeah. figure it out first. They get away fastest. Oh, I'm certain. There must have been. Yeah, I mean, how much how much wildlife caught in that? How much fled? Because we know animals flee before humans usually do. And there were lots of earthquakes that happened before. So there's definitely like oh, some warning signs. But yeah, I mean, there had to be creatures uh, <laughs> that were caught in, in the blaze. A comprehensive investigation involving multiple fields of study, including volcanology and bioanthropology, combined with numerical simulations and experiments, has shed new light on the circumstances of the eruption. Contrary to previous beliefs that the residents of Pompeii and nearby towns died due to suffocation from ash, this research published in 2010 reveals that the primary cause of death was most likely intense heat. The findings indicate that exposure to temperatures exceeding 250 degrees Celsius or 480 degrees Fahrenheit at a distance of up to 10 kilometers or 6 miles from the volcano's vent resulted in instantaneous fatalities, even for those taking shelter within buildings. The detail that always just breaks my heart is that on the morning of the second day, people came back to Pompeii. There were six pyroclastic events that made up what we are calling one eruption. We can break that up with the science now, but experiencing it, especially back then, you're not counting. But on the morning of the second day, there was a brief lull in the eruption, which scientists kind of reference as an eye of the storm moment. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people came back for their belongings, specifically for their earthly possessions. <laughs> and then at 7.30 a.m., moving at 200 miles an hour, those Romans who came back and many people who had fled to the countryside but not far enough <gasps> were essentially flash fried in a second. Oh, my God. And that's a, a really terrible thing to say, and it's an even more terrible thing to imagine, but I think it's worth really driving home the the heat death that is happening here. Mm -hmm. Because we, it's one thing to imagine people getting swallowed by lava flows, uh, which feels so, it feels like an act of God. And so it feels kind of removed. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's another thing to imagine people suffocating to death, which is a, another very common uh, belief because so much ash is falling, but to be flash fried mm -hmm. before you even necessarily realize that it's happening is wild. It's horrifying. I'm still stuck on the fact that you could be six miles away and still instantaneously die inside of a building. And listen, I'm over here running like a 10 minute mile. Tracy and I were those girls running around the track that were having a chat and not. Yes, trying to I was going to say we weren't. We weren't even running. We were the ones <laughs> barely running, more that half jog walk situation, and talking the whole time and getting yelled at by the gym teacher. That was us. But I think even at like mock Rowan speed, I'm not getting <laughs> away. <laughs> no, no way, no way. And it's worth noting that. A majority of people who died in Pompeii were too poor to leave or had nowhere else to go. So we're thinking servants, enslaved people, uh, impoverished folks who work in the countryside. There are, though, notably uh, politicians and the mayor of Pompeii actually went down with the ship, uh, so to speak. So Spencer mentioned a, a part of the Pliny the Younger quote. Uh, and I'm sure we have it from different translations, but I just think it's so moving. It's really worth highlighting because it's one of the few descriptions that we have. He said, quote, you could hear the shrieks of women, the wailing of infants and the shouting of men. People bewailed their own fate or that of their relatives. And there were some who prayed for death in their terror of dying. Many besought the aid of the gods but still more imagined there were no gods left and that the universe was plunged into eternal darkness forevermore. I admit that I derived some poor consolation in my mortal lot for the belief that the whole world was dying with me and I with it. I'm sorry, but he is just 
it's poetry. Like, if you're going to be in a natural disaster, it's going to be terrible whether you wax poetical about it or not. That's a delicious statement on the uh, horror of believing the gods are smiting you. Honestly, this quote, and maybe you two will understand why, but it makes me think of like Old Testament biblical. Oh, yeah. Like smiting. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the first reaction of the Roman Empire upon learning of the destruction of Pompeii was disbelief. This was mostly due to two reasons. First, the death toll of Pompeii may have been upwards of 20,000 Roman citizens and their families and servants. And second, the city of Pompeii was known to be a resort town that held a lot of senatorial estates. So this was like the people that were going on vacation and suddenly like they were all dead, right? Like absolutely wild. And even though the Roman people knew that the mountain had been acting strangely, several thousands of Romans continued to stay in vacation in the two largest cities, Pompeii and Herculaneum. Another reason for their shock and disbelief was the loss of the region as a popular tourist and vacation destination. The Roman people entered into a period of grieving that would have lasted for several months to a year. And we know from old engravings on Roman sarcophagi that the Roman people would have dressed in long robes, covered in ash and dirt to signify their period of mourning. So if you lived in Rome during the events of Pompeii in 79 AD, then chances are you would have worn these dark robes and grieved the loss of Pompeii as well. Imagine so many people in your community dying that every single day you get up and make yourself dirtier. Like that's such a visceral thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's such a clear physical sign of grief and a, a physical sign of the connection between all of the people of Rome and the, the Roman culture, I should say. Mm. Yeah, it makes me wonder, like, did, were they were they grieving for the people directly? Were they grieving because it was part of their empire? Were they grieving because it was a place that they sort of saw as a as a paradise? Mm -hmm. I also wonder how much of it was trying to keep it from happening again. Yeah. That is a really good point I hadn't thought of. Because if you don't know why the volcano erupted, you don't know that it's not just going to do it again. And maybe you don't know that other mountains aren't volcanoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, according to the History Ace quote, it is possible that the Roman people saw the eruption of Mount Vesuvius as punishment for their religious lives. The early Roman Empire was known to be extremely decadent, and the city of Pompeii was the pinnacle of this. The entire city served as one giant pleasure compound for the Roman people, end quote. So it's possible that Emperor Titus took the opportunity of the destruction of Pompeii to reinforce his role as the Pontifex Maximus, aka the leader of of the Roman religion. He was early on in his reign and wanted to establish himself as a strong and fair yet benevolent ruler. He offered a lot of aid to Pompeii and citizens who wished to stay in the city were given property that had been left behind by those who passed away without any heirs. So to kind of circle back, it I wasn't expecting it to this extent and it always cracks me up that people think the Romans didn't have a word for volcano until Vesuvius erupted. They didn't even know volcanoes existed. And that's that had to someone had to have tweeted that once, right? For right. that to go around and be that common a belief. We have a lot of mythological evidence to suggest that they definitely knew about volcanoes and their terrifying effects because the ancient Greeks talked about them. And if you learn nothing else on this, our Willing and Fable podcast, please remember that the ancient Romans were really just writing AO3 fanfic of the ancient Greeks and then publishing it. I want to thank you for specifying that it was AO3 fanfiction because that's what I grew up reading. I wasn't a fanfic.net girly and I missed the age of Wattpad. So I feel really seen. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, I don't know what the ancient Greek AO3 would be. So we do what we can. It would, it would have been the bulletin board. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so in Hesiod, who was ancient Greek, in his Theogony, he wrote, quote, And vast earth groaned, and a firestorm from the thunder-stricken lord spread through the dark, rugged glens of the mountain, 
and a blast of hot vapor melted the earth like tin. When smiths use bellows to heat it in crucibles or like iron, the hardest substance there is, when it is softened by fire in mountain glens and melts in bright earth under Hesphaestus's hands, so the earth melted in the incandescent flame. So, Hephaestus, or as the ancient Romans called him, Vulcan, was the god of the forge and the fire. And it was believed in ancient Greek that Hephaestus's home, his forge, was in Mount Etna, which was in Sicily, which not only was like definitely trading with Pompeii, but it's mm-hmm. right there. Oh, absolutely. So they know the volcanoes happen. They write stories about them. They just didn't have the science that we now have. And that is not mm-hmm. the same as not thinking that volcanoes are real. Well, it re- it reminds me of the claim that people make that like blue didn't exist because they use a different Ugh. word in the Odyssey. For, you know, they're talking about the wine. Uh, what is it? The wine. The wine, the dark, wine sea. dark sea. Yeah, wine dark <laughs> seas. And they're like, well, then they didn't have a word for blue. And it's like, well, there's so many reasons why they might have called them that. But mm-hmm. like, th- just because somebody doesn't have a word for a thing doesn't mean that they don't perceive it. Uh, and and you know, some some cultures call different colors different. Things they'll like wrap up orange and yellow together, or like I don't know. Right. We've talked about this before. I think off yes. podcast about about it colors. Is absolutely, the most chronically online take to think that colors just are like this <laughs> mysterious. Like if I say this is what a color is, that's what it is. That is mm-hmm. like it's not just giving Pantone; it's giving hex code, and that is not how it works. We there are cultures like Spencer said who lump orange and red and yellow together and then lump green and blue and purple together and putting those colors together not only tells you what is important to those people but it it affects the way that they continue to see the world yeah and it can it can impact your ability to see certain colors um we've talked about this before there there there's a a a test you can take online for anyone curious, but there are some cultures who live in the forest so much that they can differentiate between the most minute different shades of green because it's really important for them. Whereas I looked at it and could tell a a few of them, but certainly not all of them. I take those quizzes like it's my job. Like I want to be a mantis shrimp so bad. (laughs) I was just going to (laughs) ask... I was just going to ask, am I the worst for like wanting so badly to be able to tell all the different shades of green? And if I can't, it like hurts me. No, it wasn't fun. It wasn't. It didn't feel good. No, I've had (laughs) emotional moments about that. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not alone. Yeah, Well, especially when you have a twin sister who went to art school and looked at it and could tell all the different shades of green because she spent hours working hard at learning how to do that. Some of the most heated arguments I have seen my artist parents get in is over where blue becomes green and where like green blue becomes green and where it becomes blue. And truly, the three of us will go at it for hours trying to reach a common consensus. But the thing that really interests me about this like blue discussion around the ancient Greeks is we as modern people tend to think of white as Mm -hmm. the default. It is the uncolored page. Or sometimes black as the default. It is the unlit room. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) it's incredibly difficult to make white pigment, especially in the ancient world, because white just has to be white. You cannot add colors into pigment to make them more white. It just gets closer to brown and eventually black if it Mm -hmm. gets dark enough. So what do you think the base color was for the ancient Greeks? The color that was the most prevalent in their world that was when added to, built on how they experienced life. The sky is blue. The ocean is blue. It's it's just the the kind of like vast, Mm -hmm. basic. I just, I'm not buying that blue didn't exist. No. No, I don't I don't buy that, but I am curious and would love to to dig into that more at some point. But for now we have volcanoes. Yes, volcanoes. So, 
Pindar and Callimachus also described volcanoes in their stories, so this wasn't really a one-off situation with Hesiod. The Roman poet Virgil also described what may have been a first-hand account of a volcanic eruption at Mount Etna in the Aeneid. And interestingly, 2,000 years before Pompeii, a Bronze Age civilization was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius. The ancient Romans likely had no knowledge of this event, and by the time any version of that area that we would consider even vaguely Pompeii-esque rolled around, the volcano itself just looked like a tree-covered mountain, not a fire-filled murder machine. And knowing that volcanoes exist, in particular having mythology surrounding them, doesn't mean that you know one is in your backyard. North of Vesuvius, the Phlegrean Fields, or Campi Phlegri today, contained numerous volcanic vents and was believed to be an access point to the underworld. The Roman poet Virgil describes Aeneas doing exactly that in the Aeneid. And if you can imagine wide circular lakes, caldera, and sulfurous fumes that filled this area, I'm sure that you can imagine why Hades, or in Roman lore, Pluto, may have had the door to his domain there. And the minerals from thousands of years of volcanic activity allowed this region at large to host the verdant fields and vineyards that made it the producer of what Pliny the Elder noted to be some of the best wine in the Roman Empire. And I think that's such a beautiful testament to that uh, meeting place between Hades and Persephone of growth and death or yeah. Pluto and Proserpina, that that death begetting life. And when you understand that that was the world that they were walking around in, it's so easy to understand where that myth comes from. Whereas today, I think people, there, there can be a bit of a disconnect. And the, the thesis statement there is, did they know Vesuvius was a volcano? Probably not. Did they know that volcanoes existed in nature? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, (laughs) Tracy, your section names (laughs) are killing me. (laughs) You know this song, right, that I'm referencing here? No, Trace, why don't you sing it? Well, you can't really sing it. It's the, it's. To like, let the, I mean, I know, I know you're doing this just to make me sing it, but I'm gonna do it anyway because I'm easily persuaded. It's the let the bodies hit the floor and be preserved there. <laughs> That's why I read it in my head. So good. <laughs> People died in a variety of ways during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. There was rock fall, the weight of ash upon roofs, causing crush injuries. Uh, those are some of the more harrowing ones that it's known for. The bodies of the victims of the eruption in Pompeii remained in the same position as when the pyroclastic flow hit them. Because they were covered in calcified layers of ash, the form of their bodies was preserved even after the biological material decomposed. Thanks to the method perfected by Giuseppe Fiorelli in 1863, a little over a hundred casts have been made, and the first museum of Pompeii was opened by Fiorelli in about 1873 or 1874. And I just... I want to quickly emphasize this because this is the detail of Pompeii that I can't stop thinking about. It's that we have all of these shapes of people in their – probably after their last moments because mm-hmm. they were being buried. Um, but in the, the last moments of their existence. And by now, they have all – gone away and decomposed. So it's not what was there. It's what wasn't there that we're able to see them. We poured plaster into the holes that these people left in the rock. Right. Because it would have been that their bodies were encased and then their bodies eventually decomposed and and then we filled it in. Yeah, I think it's it's more nuanced than just saying that one detail and from one body to the next. But I'm just so – I when I first saw these, I just assumed that it was plaster over bodies and that maybe right. in some of them there was the perfect skeleton exactly hovering right in the middle of it because I don't know why. And Well, why wouldn't in, you? Why wouldn't you? That's exactly what I thought too. And in fact, we learn so much from what they – like what – their imprint left it's not them it's just this like captured moment of them Mm -hmm. well one of the things that i was watching about it as well uh they were they were pulling the the castings and and uh 
sort of showing the process by which they did this and um uh, not not directly from the 1800s, but like they were recreating kind of the way in which they would have done it to show us. And mm-hmm. um, and they were would, you watching the documentary with Doctor Laser? Yeah, Doctor Laser, the best <laughs> name yes! ever. Such a good, <laughs> such a good name for uh, for God. an archaeologist. Uh, uh, whatever they, I don't know if they're an archaeologist, but they had some sort of title that uh, that was like that, and it was like. Dr. Laser. Dr. Laser would go in and I was like, hell yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> they they would pull out the the plaster and they would have to re-sculpt the faces. Um, yeah. And so there were, there were these – so not only were they like pulling these casts, these rough casts of what people used to be like out of the ash, but then people had to spend time – on the plaster, like recreating very gently the details of what this person might have looked like. There's actually a bit of controversy about that. Like, should they have sculpted the faces? Did right. that degrade the casting? It's yeah. also did it now that we hundreds of years later have the ability to analyze the DNA, destroy any organic material that was left while still giving us something shocking, but maybe not as scientifically valuable. Listen, the 1800s did a lot of bad things as far as archaeology goes, but I can't fault them for not knowing CT scans would exist. I agree with you. 100%. (laughs) I think they did a pretty... I mean, you look, for the time period, I think that they they probably did more than other... than somebody else might have done, right? Like, somebody else might have gone in and been like, oh, there's just these holes in the ash. Whatever. (laughs) Curled up and taken a nap. Yeah, yeah. Look at them. Gross. Walk away. Yeah, gross. Walk away or destroy them or or you know anything Mm -hmm. along those lines. So the fact that we did get plaster castings and and I do think as much as there's controversy around it, I do think the idea of like these people taking the time to like say like these were humans. I'm going to give them a face. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give them an identity. uh, Is something that, in the very least, to me, is an interesting reaction that those people have yeah. more than anything you know they're like oh these were people mm-hmm. what's unfortunate is that many of the casts that are on display were destroyed or badly damaged by bombings in 1943 but there has been a partial restoration and within the framework of the great pompeii project an inspection has been carried out and some casts that were thought to have been lost have actually been found again Woo! Additionally, the old plaster or resin casts were laser scanned in order to print 3D copies to loan all over the world for temporary exhibitions while the precious original casts instead will be put on display in Pompeii. Shout out to Dr. Laser. We love the great work of Dr. Laser. (laughs) I'm also going to shout out Mary Beard because I love her and she's fascinating. Shout out to Laser and Beard. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So... (sighs) The last detail that I, I quickly want to mention, and the segue is is terrible, but anyone who knows about Pompeii will know that there's a famous cast where it looks like the fallen person may have been a man who was masturbating. And we now know that as charming as that is, it is patently untrue. The reality is that we see the people in the positions that they're in in some ways because that's where they fell, but also the incredible amount of heat that killed them caused all of their muscles to contract Mm -hmm. to the extent that their teeth ground. (gasps) Whoa. So when I say contraction, it's not just simply like the hand closing. It is the hand grabbing in death. And it's the arms pulling in, these kind of fetal positions. And I... I just think that's so moving. I think of like paper or like grasses when they burn and how they like curl oh, yeah, in. Curl. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like how yeah, it like curls up Yeah, that instantaneous crunch. Boom, it just curls in. And I can only imagine human beings being flash fried, having the same reaction of like their body just curls into itself. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that's what we see. Like a lot of the, I mean, we have some images here from from Pompeii that uh, we've kind of been referencing, and and like a lot of them look like their arms are curled up under their under their chin, or their legs, you know, their toes are curled, and their legs are pulled up. And and I can only imagine that as they fell, like their bodies just contracted into themselves. They kind of look like leaves. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. 
It leaves mm. as they dry up. All right. So I have the distinct pleasure of being the first story in our very long series on Pompeii <laughs> and yes. Herculaneum and Acts of God. Tracy, I want to apologize in advance. This story is specifically built to the taste of Spencer Stark. Uh, oh, yeah. I knew it was going to be said. <laughs> no, I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Amazing. I think I have done a great and terrible thing not loving you sooner. I realize this at the end of the world. The air is so hot that my hair curls. The sky is darkness and drifting gray ash. Dogs howl, birds scream, babies cry. People run, stumbling, this way and that, to wherever they believe might be safest. Away, they say, I must away. But this is the last day of the world. We are but small creatures, and away is too far, if it is anywhere at all. You looked back at me, your eyes full of panic and your arms full of whatever belongings your panic forced you to grab. Sandals, a basket, the statuette of an absent god. I held out my hand and said, stay home with me. This was not your home. It wasn't my home. This was the household where we worked. The masters long gone. In all fairness to the prior circumstances, you were not my love. Though we had loved, merrily and often, the feeling was gone by now, too many years between us. You smile at me half laughing, and I loved you again in an instant. And I endeavored to love you for every moment I had left, few though they might be. I led you to the bed that was not ours, and wondered about what petty mundanity drove us apart so long ago. I couldn't recall and only felt ashamed that I had believed there were more worthy lovers, a grander love, an epic's passion with no fights over the wash or wear of the house. I bridged that gap between regretting the wasted time and loving you now, Without words. The air was so full of ash that speaking was impossible. The gods demanded we die in silence. So I removed your shoes, forcing my trembling hands to slow, and felt the soft golden down of your legs. I savored the curve of your stiffened spine, the crash of falling rocks on distant roofs making us jump all the while. We were past even kisses now, and only embraced, like children protecting one another. Mm, no, like a couple, long-lived, grown ancient together, and bowed back into childhood by weak muscles and unreliable bowels. You and I lay together in the bed as if we always had, terrified of death, as all mortals must come to be. I couldn't smell your hair, but I remembered the saffron scent. Your skin felt rough and dusty, though I knew it to be supple and slicked in worker's sweat. Your eyes were warmest brown, once crinkling at the edges, where now they were sealed shut in terror. I focused all my energy into loving you and contorted every thought like a shield around your body. I thought, I love you. The set of your shoulders, the scar on your neck from a childhood fall. I love the puckers on your face from illness and the soft petal pink of your bitten lips. In the last moments, I loved all that I had hated in you. Your shrill, stubborn shouts, your hard hands, your politics. We were beset by so much heat that we baked together. My love and I. We crisped and cracked, our muscles compacting into an embrace so tight, our bones creaked like ships in a storm. And then we were melted into one shape, so there was no me and there was no you. We were covered, two lovers in a chrysalis, that the gods may one day deign to crack releasing us like the plagues of Pandora, screaming, it does not hurt to die. It's just that it's a terrible agony to be kept from living. I found, in the last moment, when the heat first coaxed me like a womb into near comfort, that my mind wandered. A thought 
of an impossible future, the way I might pass you on a stair and lift a tired smile at the clumsy misstep I would take. It seared me to see my smile then. I'd prepared myself to remember all the pieces of my past that paved the road to Pompeii. I was ready to mourn my childhood, my boisterous youth, the doors I'd closed and the fences I'd torn down. Like laying a body to rest, I thought it would be. This one mine, but still a remembering of living. But no one told me that dying is more like dreaming than remembering. And it's so lonely to look at the infinite stretch of the future with all the places you've known and people you've loved and only wish that you could stay. I wondered, can the dead miss those they've left behind? Then thought, commanded myself to think of you. My love, in this last moment, there's hardly any time. I thought, you feel like... Then the end. The dead can miss those they've gone from. Our brains simmered like a stew beneath the ash. <laughs> that powerful organ that pioneered those last thoughts cooked down into a shining black rock, almost glass. I was surprised to learn that my thoughts did, for all the poets singing, crystallize. I have loved you well for as long as I could. As firm as a thought and heavy as a stone. We rotted away slowly in our underworld that was once a city. We fell apart, embrace falling into the commingling of bones, my fingers becoming your hands, your spine supporting my fall. We decomposed until all that remained of us was the places we weren't, where the ash and rain petrified your last scream and my suffocation. My loving you, a crystal of dying thoughts locked in the tomb of our embrace. Even now I wish I'd loved you sooner, but no one could love you longer. And I have loved you so very well. I believed love was a grandness. The never fighting and the thrill of it all. But love is soft and steadfast. Not Sisyphus, but the stone. What a grand life to toil away for such a thing as this, I thought. You feel, to me, like coming home. There's something that you do when writing that I was so focused on during this story, which is you turn prose into poetry. Oh, thanks. I genuinely don't know how you do it and it is so beautiful to me yeah I think uh I think it's we often judge ourselves and others for getting really corny and poetic about love but if you're gonna die in the last horrible moments of the entire world you know why not yeah I think you get a pass in that yeah, situation no certainly it's it's, it's it's like magic. <laughs> I don't have any other way of describing uh, the yeah. way in which like you combine words to create magic, but that's that's kind of the beauty of 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 what you do and I think that it's so uh it's so magical to hear you take the image of probably the most famous image of a natural disaster in existence, which is the two people curled up together in Pompeii and to bring it to life um, and to give it give it a story. And uh, yeah, it's stunning. Absolutely stunning. Thank you. The detail in there that folks who have not done the research that I have done might not know because I didn't know it uh, is that they found inside uh, some of the rock where I believe in actually Herculaneum, but where they were uncovering bodies, they found these like obsidian glass looking bits of rock and they think now from dna testing that those are people's brains <gasps> cooked wild oh my god and i can't stop 
thinking about that. I think there's it's more science fiction to imagine like someone's thoughts being captured in a crystal and then you yes! can plug that crystal That's into exactly something. That's exactly what it feels like. But I imagine if someone had the forethought to say like if this is my last moment of thinking what do I want that thought to be? And then if we could come around now and find that rock of yeah. thought, what what would become of that? It reminds me of the record that we sent, the golden record that we sent out to space mm -hmm. where yes. they recorded the brain waves of these people uh, and and sent it out. And that was like literally their their brain. Uh, mm -hmm. but preserved forever, right, in space in that same kind of way. Like if, if those end up if, – if if those are the, the brains of the people that died there, like it is a preserved uh, – is preserved in stone, <laughs> the last mm -hmm. memories that they had. I also think about if this were happening in my life now wherever I am and I were – there was only one person that I was around and I knew I couldn't get away. Even if that person was my worst enemy, I think that I would love them if they were the person that held me while the world burned to nothing. Yeah. I think there is something there that y it must feel like love, whether yes. you intend it to or not. That's No, that's so true and it's so beautiful and I can't put it in any better words than that, but... I think when you go through something really tough with someone, you inherently feel like there's a bond formed, and and in that moment, if those, if that's, if that is the only person that is even around you, yeah, I think you're gonna feel this instantaneous. We are both humans, and there is something that is beyond human happening to us right now. And it's a big piece of conversation, I think, especially because of The Last of Us coming out. But mm -hmm. if the world is ending and you know you can't get away. What will you do instead of run or fight? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what I would do. I think I try to have really good last thoughts. I think about that often. I think about what I want my last thought to be. <laughs> I don't. But the thing that plagues me often is the thought that for many people, their last day is a normal day and they don't know. And the thought being just – five minutes ago, everything was normal. Hmm. That is what gets me. Harder to stare down the barrel of a gun, I think. There's that, that movie, uh, it doesn't really exactly, but it has a kind of similar message. Um, it's About Time. Do you know About Time? I think it's called About oh, Time. Oh, I feel like I must. Let me double check it before I start. Yes, it's About Time. 2013, and it's... Um, oh, yes, I've seen Donald it. Donald Gleeson, it's, it's Rachel like McAdams, a... Bill Nye... It's like an airplane rom-com now. Yeah, kind of. It, but it has the – it's a rom-com, but it's about um, – a, it's about a, a man who discovers that the men in their family can go back in time, can travel through time. And what it becomes is what starts out as a sort of fun rom-com romp becomes this reflection on – what it means to embrace every moment that you have because there's and I don't want to spoil anything but the ending has this twist that I have not stopped thinking about since I saw it in 2013 like I think about oh, it oh wow every every couple of months it's a good movie and okay. yeah anyway it has that like what do you do what what do you do to live every moment as if it's your last. Yeah. Um, and and taking that philosophy of like, it could be the last day, what do I do if it's my last day? Um, I think asks of us more than we ask on a daily basis, right? Like it asks us to mm -hmm. live in a way that we wouldn't normally live. And I think that while we make decisions for the future all the time, and we absolutely should, uh, there's, there is a magic in going like, yeah, but what about like, right now like how do we make mm -hmm. right now the best it can possibly be yeah i think yeah, that, that's something that i was thinking a lot about in this which is like people imagine love or any one moment any relationship there's always this bigger grander what if 
Mm -hmm. It could be. And while I'm certainly this has nuance and limits, I think that there's something to be said for savoring and making grand and poetic the just boring parts because they're so good if you let it be. And I don't mean to say that every moment is happy and joyful, but listen, I could write a scene of a really crummy day where two people are arguing and sitting by the fire and reading, and it would still – it would sound pretty grand, even though it's just mundanity. Like, we can Mm -hmm. make it happen if you just enjoy. Yeah. All right. You delivered something beautiful to us, Rowan. I'm going to turn it around to Spencer (laughs) <laughs> and say that as our guest, uh, it is your turn to tell us something good. Oh, I got to tell you something good. Okay. Um, so my something good is that I am preparing to go to Big Bad Con. Woo! Um, yeah, me too. Which is my favorite con in the world. It's a games con. It's a story games con. And uh, I'm going to be on a panel with Rowan there. And then, Rowan, you're going to be on a bunch Yay! of panels too. Um, and as you both should be, this is amazing. (laughs) And it's, uh, my favorite con because I get to see everybody that I care about that I don't get to see all the time, um, Mm -hmm. in the games industry. So it's a lot of designers. It's a lot of, you know, um, a lot of people in the community that I'm internet friends with. And Mm -hmm. for one time a year, we get to like see each other, not just over zoom cameras or twitter you know um and so anyway it's my favorite con and it's so focused on like storytelling and um and we had a a life change a life-changing experience last year uh last big bad con was profound it was incredible and i think (sighs) we might have hyped it up too much because because now like so many people are going like the entire Mm -hmm. con sold out this year oh yeah and you guys have definitely like talked about it a lot, uh, which is great because we want it to be successful. Right. Also, I don't think that every possible year can be that profound. And so I don't want people or myself to go and be like, OK, big time. And then it's just a good time. You know, it's a mundane right. good time. It's so, not <laughs> grand. So I'm just excited to be able to go and relax and hang out with people and talk with people I don't normally get to like actually be in the same room with and it's going to be great. Tracy, tell me something good. Tell us something good. Yeah, yeah. I thought a lot about this because a lot's happened since the last time we were able to kind of do this and I think it's a habit I've formed over the years now that I, I often think throughout the week, oh, that was lovely. Like that could be my something good or, you know, experience this and um i have two things here the first one is that i think everyone needs to watch season two of good omens i mean you should watch (laughs) season one as well but season two is just it's beautiful and it is quiet and it focuses on crowley and aziraphale and their relationship and it's heartbreaking and wonderful and um it's love it doesn't have to be romantic love i just want them to be in love yes that's the whole season oh good it's so good I truly can't say enough good things about it. The brain rot has been devastating. And then the other thing that's causing me devastating brain rot is uh, Baldur's Gate 3, which came mm. out, which is basically D&D the video game. And I got it years ago when they did the early access and played. And now the full game is out. And it is just so much better and bigger and grander. And uh, the writers deserve all the credit in the world for the way that they've thought through these characters and their storylines and their arcs and the implications and the choices you make. And it's just beautiful. Be honest. How long did it take you to make your character? It's not how long it took me to make the character. It's how many have I made? How many? I don't know. I don't know. A lot. <laughs> many. <laughs> I've downloaded mods. I play it because I have my one playthrough that I'm I'm finally almost done the game. It's been, I don't know, 300 hours. And yeah, it's insane. And then there's a, a way you can play called uh, the Dark Urge, which is a, you can have your backgrounds. You could be an, an acolyte, a charlatan. Uh, you know, and then there's one that's a Dark Urge. And for some reason, you have no idea who you are other than your name. And you were you if you were like a cleric or a fighter, you remember how to fight, but you don't remember why. And you have this insatiable urge that you have to murder. You have to kill. And it's exploring what that means for you. Are you a monster? How the characters interact with you. So my next playthrough is gonna be a dark urge playthrough. And I'm very excited. What if they're just hungry? 
<laughs> They're just I know, hangry. I know the real reason uh, why the Dark Urge playthrough happens because I've seen spoilers. And also once you play through the game once, you're like, huh, I think I've put it together. Like, I think they originally intended the game for you to have this background. It just really makes sense for the story they're telling. But then I guess they went, okay, we see that you want to make your own D&D character. <laughs> so we'll let you do that too. <laughs> you just make you a little um, hangry. A little hangry. At night, you just get a little snacky. You and Astarian, you get a little snacky. He's the <laughs> vampire that everyone's in love with. Ah, got it. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> All right, Rowan, it's your turn. Tell us something good. Yeah, well, everyone who experienced me get riled up about colors not but 20 minutes ago um, <laughs> will <laughs> maybe appreciate this. Uh, my good, tell me some, my, th mm -hmm. <laughs> you're nailing it. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone uh, shut up. She's doing great. Keep going. <laughs> My Tell Me Something Good is The Secret Lives of Color. It's a book by, I, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Cassia St. Clair. When I tell you that everyone I know is getting this book for any gift giving holiday that comes up, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't care if they even like reading. This is this is the book, man. Um, it it breaks up collections of colors and then she picked notable colors from them and does a two to four page history on each one. And it is just like mm, amazing. If, if anybody enjoyed um, Dress to Kill in the Quick Start Guide of Candela Obscura, that the, the people who like that will like this book. Okay, well, then um, I'll like this because I was a big fan of that. Yeah, well, don't buy it because I wasn't kidding. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> and with that, next week, we will continue on with our discussion of Pompeii and talk about the excavations and some of the shocking or shocking to 18th century archaeologists finds that were discovered after the eruption. But in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Spencer, thank you also for joining us. I'm glad to yes. be here. Thank you for having me. Do you want to do the closing? No. <laughs> Just, Just when I pause, say or tell a foe. Okay. Got it. Okay. I'm on it. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember, stories grow with the telling. So if you like what we do, tell a friend. Or a foe. I broke Rowan. <laughs> yes. I jumped in. I jumped in. I jumped in and broke Rowan. <laughs> the line is, or tell a foe, eh, is why I cackled. <laughs> um, because I was sitting here going, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it. And then you said it before I could. And so I had to like bite my tongue, literally. Um. And we'll see you soon, okay? <laughs> <laughs>Thank you so much for joining us for the Willing and Fable podcast. This episode was written and produced by Tracy Harrison and Rowan Hall. That's me. Our logo is by Jamie Harrison, and our music is by Taylor Ash. If you ever want to watch or read what we're reading, head over to willingandfable.com for our show notes and custom merch, or find us at Willing and Fable on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok to join the discussion. We hope you'll rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast using your favorite listening source. And check out Willing and Fable on Patreon, where we have more than a few surprises for you, including custom artwork, stories, and access to our secret Discord channel. And of course, join us next time for another round of original retellings and in-depth research on the history, mystery, and mythology that makes the world so fascinating. Macquarie University of Australia writes in the article Pompeii and Herculane Her Herculaneum. I it's like Hercules, but it's it's Hercules' city. That is what it is. It's Hercules' city. It's but it's not Herculeseum. <laughs> no, unfortunately. <laughs> we could change much it. too. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's Herculeseum you know, now. For for my uh, friends, Herculeum. it can be Herculeseum. <laughs>